Ladies and gentlemen, the third installment, episode three here of Parkour History with Max Henry. We are going to be talking about Raymond Bell, a very critical, very pivotal figure, and one of the key kind of bottleneck choke points of the whole story of the lineage of parkour. One of my favorite stories and one of the most interesting and tragic and everything. It's got a whole movie that I need to see one day um, being made about this particular part of the story so where do we begin max yeah no that's a good way i think it's very human Mm. raymond's story and i think before we even get into it this is a really good time to just point out that um especially later on in raymond's life there's a lot of he said she said that goes on because it it is a very personal story and i think it touches on some private and really like sensitive matters that haven't become public yet. So uh, this is another good place to say while we're doing our best to convey historical accuracy, there are times where it might come out in a decade that, you know, something's a little bit different and we're kind of just waiting on the players to speak up and, and share that story if they feel up to it. And if not, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll do our best to, to treat everybody involved with as much respect as uh, they're owed and so if there's a little bit of ambiguity around this for the listener, you know, that's where this is coming from. It's, it's still in development. And obviously the people that are directly affected by Raymond's legacy are, you know, alive and well and training hard and still actively involved in the community. Yeah. Very well said. <clears throat> yeah. It's still, yeah, we can, and we'll let you know when we're speculating and when things are factual that we can point to. Absolutely. Yep. And, and when the biggest resources that we're going to go off of on this, David Bell wrote a book that was essentially a transcription, um, that's available on scribed and a few other online resources as a PDF. He has some quotes in there that I'm going to pull about his dad. Um, Sebastian Foucault has done several podcasts now where he talks a little bit about Raymond and I was lucky enough to get to sit down with him for three hours and just pick his brain about, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today and in future episodes. And uh, additionally, Julie Angel's book, Breaking the Jump, is another good resource from uh, Chow and Williams' perspective. And they're, they were growing up with Raymond in the house. So they're also really vital uh, people for kind of understanding that whole situation. But, you know, that's all kind of toward the end of the story. Mm-hmm. And to tie Raymond's legacy yeah, where back. did we leave off? Yeah, we left off in last episode, right? We had kind of this decline of natural method. And one of the things that we talked about in the last episode is after the wars, kind of disastrous wars that happened in Vietnam and in Algeria, that was one of the factors that convinced the French military to move away from méthode naturelle and away from combat-oriented training. Before that we still have its presence very, very strongly felt in the military. And that's where Raymond Bell picks up kind of his initial fascination for movement. So Raymond Bell, he's born in Hue, Vietnam in 1939. His dad was a French doctor. His mother's Vietnamese. Um, They had a just middle-class upbringing, kind of well-to-do. And he had nine siblings, crazy house (laughs) running around. And... They went on vacation. Do we know what in, was he in the, like in the peck, not pecking order, but like where in the sibling ratio was he? That's a middle? great question. I'm actually not sure. Okay. I'm not sure if he was on the younger or the older side. Um, but what we do know is that, you know, his early years were, were pretty what you would expect from somebody who was in that society at that time. Uh, when he was seven, he went to visit his uncle and just horrible timing because at that time 1946 the first Indochina war breaks out and this is essentially the the war for Vietnamese kind of independence and also political autonomy so you have uh, forces in North Vietnam who are uh, communist forces that are fighting against the French democratic forces in the south and so you have this interesting like semi-political but also Mm anti-colonial war that's being fought and 
there's sort of a line of battle that's drawn right down the middle and Raymond's parents end up on one side. Yeah, Hue is literally right in the middle of Vietnam. Just yeah. for those who don't know. The and you've geography. been to Hue. Been to Hue. Yeah. And you can see the, you know, the remnants, you could say, I guess, of the, the, the bombing and stuff. It's still very present in that city. It's a very historical city. And you can see that it was ravaged by this war. And I do find it pretty interesting, kind of as an aside, that that Vietnam, was. it's a very, especially at that time, right? It's very East meets West. You have obviously mm-hmm. a, a ton of heritage native to Vietnam that then is uh, like recontextualized by French colonialism. And Raymond is a really good example of this in a lot of ways like you know his dad is a french doctor is like this bastion of Mm. french liberal thought and scientism and then his mom is just part of this big um big family vietnamese family and one thing that they do mention david mentions in his book is uh i i think actually raymond was the seventh child Mm. because apparently his mother was um there was like a superstition about that whatever he was in the pecking order i think the seventh kid being being bad luck oh yeah and so yeah and so i i believe he was he was maybe the seventh kid um and you know sadly when you talk about bad luck being separated from your family in the middle of a war is about as bad as it gets um he ends up with his uncle and his uncle is surprised to suddenly have a seven-year-old on his hands um we don't know that much about what happened there one thing that david briefly mentions in his book and doesn't really go into specifics is that raymond may have suffered some abuse while he was at his uncle's and what we do know for a fact is that raymond's uncle takes him to delat military academy um pretty much within a few months of him being separated from his parents and to a lot kind of like where George Bear went to school, it's prestigious. It has the, you know, this steep uh, tradition of French military and it's, it's arguably the best military school in Vietnam at the time. And so Raymond is in there, but a lot of the other kids don't come from his background. You know, they're not coming from this pseudo like aristocratic wealthy background. There a lot of them are orphans you know we're in the middle of a war so where do you send these kids you're going to send them to military academy so that they can be trained to become soldiers Um, there's orphans there's a lot of kids from broken homes and for raymond this is a far cry from growing up in this gorgeous suburban home in hue now you know these kids are essentially fighting to create this pecking order and it's almost like an Ender's Game vibe that he finds himself in, where he's got to suddenly prove that he's strong and he can take control. Otherwise, he's going to suffer hmm. physically, emotionally um, from these other students. And so he's really thrust from this emotional trauma of being separated, potentially being abused, being abandoned, in essence, by his uncle to now suddenly being in this really harsh world where he has no one to rely on and he is trying to make himself as strong as possible to protect himself, to preserve, you know, what was left of this little kid. Uh, And this is all happening in a year's time. So he kind of jumps into training Mm -hmm. with abandon. That's where he finds his source of stability at this time and one of the main things that they trained the the children in were these parkour du combattant and raymond realizes that the stronger he is the harder it is for other people to hurt him and david talks about this in his book you know Mm. he's he he talks about raymond needing to build this shell and feeling this pathological need to become stronger and that drives him to just train like an absolute madman (laughs) And he's like, not just doing push up. Like it's like middle of the night. Yeah, he's he's up at two a.m. doing a thousand push ups, but it's also you know he's punching trees and stones. He's like hitting sandbags against his face to make his face harder and and more abrasive and less able to, you know, 
be broken open by somebody's fist mm. in the actual military school they're learning to assemble and disassemble weapons they're up in the mountains hiking at night and you know there's wildlife i mean i don't think there were tigers in this part of vietnam but there's plenty of dangerous wildlife snakes and other things like that and these are 10 to 12 year old kids out alone in the woods for hours at a time in the middle of the night with no guidance and this need to become stronger he's really channeling all of the trauma that he's experienced into that mm. and in particular he's drawn to these parcours de combattants he goes out at night according to david's book and creates his own with friends in the woods so not only is he doing the ones that are established already that the military has set but eventually they become too easy he can do them you know blindfolded and asleep and <laughs> a hand behind his back and so he and his friends start to come up with more difficult parkour de combattant they mm. create their own and already for the listener you can start to see an echo of what we're going to see later on with david and sebastian and jan and chow and william the friends that start to create their own courses yeah. and what's become a big part of our culture and what it means to to practice parkour for sure absolutely and for raymond this is definitely a coping mechanism uh it, it's an effective one it gets him through the war mm. and he does incredibly well mm. uh, so in 1954 the french forces are defeated by the Viet Minh, and this is the preface to u.s involvement in the vietnam war and Raymond, being enlisted in the French military at that time, isn't abandoned for once. Thankfully, he's put on a boat to Lyon to continue his education, uh, thanks to military involvement. And he ends up in France. He's 16. He doesn't really know anybody. There are a few people that he kind of knows from the village or from Hue and, you know, vague connections. But in the intervening years, he'd found out his dad was assassinated. His mother, he reached out to her and she was still alive, but she didn't want to reconnect with him. And so he ends up in Lyon as a 16-year-old with training for war, but really no peacetime training. And you think about, you know, what you learn between the ages of 7 and 16. You take a 5-year-old kid. <laughs> that kid is brutal, man. That's a brutal age, like 3 to 5, and you're just starting to kind of learn how to civilize yourself and then all of a sudden you're ripped from all of that and put into this uh crucible so raymond gets a little bit of guidance when he arrives in leon he finishes school and a, a friend that he made that you know they'd had an acquaintance from hue who also ended up in leon saw how well raymond had done in school saw his athletic ability and at this time you know like the end of his school year raymond was setting military academy records in france for long jump and for high jump he'd done some gymnastics uh there's actually there's some, some footage there's some footage so yeah crazy and cool yeah he he's doing like double fronts off of a high bar <laughs> on, <laughs> on terezi mat outside uh, and he could do backflips and all these other things and obviously he's uh, pretty accomplished in combat you know, that was a, a major thing that they were learning in military academy as well, hand-to-hand mm. -hand combat and self-defense. So this acquaintance recommends that Raymond try to join the sapeurs-pompiers. And the sapeurs-pompiers are the kind of elite firefighters of Paris. And now this is one thing that a, a listener might be able to correct me on. I believe that they are uh, associated with the military. Yeah, that's my understanding. So, or like it's a, not the same as what we might imagine in the Americas, or no. I don't know whatever country it is. But it's like this is, this is like a, a much more. Uh, it's more like the Navy SEALs. It's not exactly like that, but it is more like that than it than you're probably thinking of it when you think of an American firefighter. Yeah, it's no, like there's this is a military training position that is sort of specialized and elite. Absolutely, yeah. It it is. Um, it's certainly elite. The test to get into the sapeur pompier is pretty renowned for being a difficult one. 
And yeah, it's not Dalmatians and pizza and, and sliding down the pole <laughs> while you're, while you're no waiting for No disrespect to firefighters here in the States. Obviously, we, that's not what love, American yeah. firefighters do yeah, either. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> no, it's just, yeah, but for sure it's, um, it's just different, you know, especially at that time. Yeah, there's a different uh, cultural impact, I guess, to joining the Sapu. And Raymond goes to take the exam, passes with flying colors. In David's book, again, David's talking about Raymond's experience with the test and it was essentially Raymond had trained himself so hard alone in the jungle and he'd also been through so much I didn't even mention this but in one of Sebastian's podcasts mm. he mentions that they used to play hot potato with live grenades as oh, yeah. children like 12 13 years old and um, at one point Raymond had seen one of his classmates die tripping either a grenade or a landmine during a training exercise. So for Raymond at the age of 18, joining the Sapu and taking this exam, he put himself through such rigorous training that it was a joke. And he'd mm. already, he'd already kind of made peace with death in a, in a certain way. It was not something abstract for him and he'd seen it firsthand. So he jumped into the Sapu Pompier and he immediately differentiates himself as this heroic, really competent firefighter. And it was like all of the trauma that he had endured and all of those scars that he'd built up and those, the skills that he'd developed to deal with them, suddenly they had an outlet that wasn't violence, that wasn't directed at somebody else and hurting somebody else. It was, now I have the ability to use these skills to help somebody. Hmm. And the Sapeur Pompier also had a really, really long legacy with Hébert's Méthode Naturelle. And so the French military, we remember, kind of had adopted a watered down, physically oriented version of the natural method. The Sapeur Pompier, it seems like, kept a little bit more of the ethos. Mm. And Raymond really got to dig into that spirit of être fort, être utile, and be strong to be useful while he was working with the Sapo Pompier. He, I think for him, it must have just been such an amazing chance mm. to almost start a new life. And you get the sense from hearing Sebastian and David talk about this period of Raymond's life that it was this renaissance for him. Mm. In 1969, he becomes the first person to accomplish a helicopter rescue in France. The... Viet Cong flag is being hung from the spire of Notre Dame and it's obviously Notre Dame. This is televised nationally. How are we going to get it down? They try to go up, but whoever had put the flag up there had sabotaged rungs to climb up the spire. Mm -hmm. And so even with equipment, they judged it was too dangerous to climb to the spire and remove, remove the flag. And the only way they realized they could get it down is to lower somebody from a helicopter hover the helicopter and have someone remove it. And the person that they pick for that job is Raymond. So Raymond Bell is the first person dangling from a <laughs> helicopter on national TV to remove the flag of the Viet Cong. And, and I mean, additionally for, for him who his entire life was uprooted by the origins of that conflict must have been an incredibly profound and probably somewhat troubling moment yeah it's got to be conflicting <laughs> for absolutely sure. your uh, heritage is tied into that whole story whether you know you feel one way about it or not it's 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 right in your face especially in that kind of moment absolutely and he's picked for this job he does it phenomenally he continues to perform at a high level in 1975, he ends up being awarded the Bronze Medal of Honor by the French government. And he kind of caps in 1975 this legendary career as a sapeur pompier. So the average service time for one of the sapeur pompiers, like five years, Raymond was active at varying levels in the last few years, but he was actively in the service for about 15 years. Mm. So he was in it. Mm -hmm. for much longer and at a much higher level in an elite yeah. company of firefighters than most people. And an interesting thing that Sebastian mentioned again in one of his podcasts, one of the reasons he ended up joining the Sapeur Pompier, he 
wanted to confirm some of the legends that he'd heard about Raymond as a young man mm. because uh, we're not yeah, yeah. quite there yet and we'll get into it, but he'd heard <laughs> some, some legends and Se- Sebastian was the only one of the Yamakaze to become a firefighter. He was immersed in that culture. He knew people firsthand who had worked with Raymond and yeah, it was, it was true as <laughs> he a, found out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the legends are true and he's, you know, this guy was a superstar and is, you know, what you're sort of describing. I mean, amongst in that, in that light, he was, he was just somebody who's shown or in that context, he was a, someone who's shown brighter than almost anyone. Yeah. I mean, if, if they'd had a drama about, mm. you know, like there's like fire department dramas. What's the one that there's one about the FDNY. Oh yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. With what's his name. Never mind, but, but if they'd yeah. had, if they had one of those about the supper pompier, like yeah. Raymond would have been the base model yeah. for whoever their lead actor would have been, you know, he yeah. was that kind of character. So it's 1975. He's just been awarded the bronze medal of honor and his professional life is at its peak and sadly you know his personal life is a little bit more strained um earlier you know a decade and a half or so earlier he had met a woman named monique whose father had also been a sapper pompier and they end up getting married and having children uh first oldest is daniel and then jean francois and their youngest son david comes along in 1973 and the astute listener probably is thinking david bell i know that name <laughs> and we're gonna get to kind of david's link oh, he in gets a second. his own few episodes probably <laughs> more than one episode we'll see we're gonna get to david's link in a second but you know with all of the trauma that raymond has experienced he's not the most traditional father or husband and it makes sense he grew up without parents he learned to kind of become strong on his own and probably experienced a lot of emotional abuse and potentially more both from his uncle and and from his mom. And he didn't want to continue that cycle of violence, I would assume, in the same way. So he removes himself pretty deeply from his family's life, at least on the day-to-day. He's still around, but He's not a day-to-day part of his children's lives, particularly David. So David um, goes to live with his grandfather, Gilbert, in Normandy, in Ficamp. And Raymond eventually moves out and decides to... And Gilbert is... Uh, Gilbert his, is, is Raymond's father father-in-law. In law. Yeah. yeah, Raymond's father-in-law, David Bell's grandfather. So that's, uh, sorry, his wife's Michelle... Uh, Monique. Monique. What the fuck am I saying? Monique's, <laughs> Monique. Gil, Gilbert is Monique's dad. Yeah, maybe we can do a quick family tree. So yeah, you've got we, Raymond and Monique. Raymond and Monique, married. married. They have they have three children. Daniel, Dan- Jean-Francois, and David. And then David as the youngest. And Jean-Francois and Daniel are living, I guess, with Monique, but they send David to live with Monique's father, Gilbert. Yes. Because... Who was also a sapo pompier. Oh, okay. And they, yeah, 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 they send him to live in, in Fécamp. And so this is uh, about the time that, this is like after 1975, Raymond moves to Sarcel to live with his nephew and becomes a deeper part of his extended family's lives over there. And becomes so this kind is of, Monique's... No, this is on the other side, actually. So this is Raymond's Vietnamese family that's, that's, that at yeah. the time living... So, in yeah, suburbs Raymond has, of Paris. Has extended Vietnamese family in the suburbs of Paris. Yes. And they were some of the same folks that, that were in Hue that when... Uh, sorry, let me I'm just, not totally sure about when they came. But, okay, yeah. We don't know when exactly, but, you know, they they were also... They were on they his mom's way, side. On his mom's side. So, we what what we do know is, yeah, it's, on his, it's family on his mom's side. They're at the time living in Sarcel, which is this really beautiful wooded suburb Mm. uh, outside of Paris. And uh, Raymond decides to move there after he gets the Medal of Honor and leaves the Sapeur Pompier. He becomes like a private security contractor for some of the big skyscrapers in Paris. And he starts to get a little bit more involved in the lives of his, I guess, what are they? Grand, (laughs) grand nephews. Mm -hmm. Um, You've got uh, Fung and Chow and eventually William Bell. And at this time, David, we're going to return to David for a second. 
is growing up in Vicomp with his grandfather and sorry i gotta interrupt you again i just gotta make sure i this yeah because actually just he's, it's grandnephew it's not his nephews so he's living with his nephew he's living so he had siblings on his mom's side that came back to france with you know maybe adjacent whatever maybe before maybe after the Viet Minh defeated the yeah uh, the french in the south but at any point those their those his siblings had children and those that's who he's living with yes okay and, and I'm as far as we know from as far as the translation know. that i okay. read of david's okay pdf <laughs> so that's interesting to me just i just I, I thought maybe it would be like his direct siblings and then shao fung and william no, are he's his a, nephews but they're actually grand nephews yeah he's he's great uncle raymond he's to, great uncle raymond to because his life Shao had a sort william. of offshoot i mean again we look back generations there's more turnover in the generations previous you know people yeah. aren't waiting so long to have children so already there's like grown nephews that yeah. you can stay with and he was born in 1939 and this mm. is like the end of the 1970s okay yeah so he's not he's not young, young he's but old. he i mean he's not old but you know at that time in particular and, and obviously you know culturally like everybody has different times that they have kids and stuff yeah. so he's uh a little bit behind in, in generationally from yeah. his nephews and and yeah. his, his siblings and so he's living with his nephew in Sarcelle. Their children are growing up with great uncle Raymond. And David is seeing all of this kind of from afar, hearing these legendary stories about his dad and not being a part of his father's life at all. So when David gets the chance to go and live with his mother, Monique and Lise, he is ecstatic because, you know, I get to see this person. Mm. more i mean obviously he'd seen his dad but i get to be in my father's life a little bit more i get to hear some of these stories firsthand and we all were 12 year old boys well half of the listeners <laughs> <laughs> probably were 12 year old boys at some point you remember that feeling of hero worship that you have for your role models at that age and you know it's very clear that david had this vision of his father as a, an absolute hero yeah. and he was a superhero yeah. Not just a normal person. He was accomplishing these superhuman feats. And at this time, David and eventually his, his young friend, Sebastian, start to engage a little bit more with Raymond. And they, you know, make the journey to Sarcelle. And we get to hear some amazing stories now that are firsthand from David and from Sebastian. And in his book, David has a couple. I love he's talking about playing essentially a game of tug of war with Raymond and you know, they're holding a stick. Raymond's holding a stick and he says to a couple of the boys, you know, go ahead. And if you can make me move by pulling this stick, you know, that's that you win. And they're trying as hard as they can. And they're like 13 or 14. They're not seven <laughs> and they cannot move him. And at the time he's in his mid fifties, maybe <laughs> almost 60. And he's just rock solid. Like you can't move me. And, you know, David tells a story as well in the book about watching his uh, dad get down from something and have to take like a five or six foot drop. And he's like, wow, you know, that was so quiet and strong. And Raymond goes, yeah, I, I used to be able to jump from here and points to something that's like 20 feet up. And he goes, yeah, I used to just be able to jump down from this, but I don't, I don't do it as much anymore, but you should be able to jump off something that high. Like that's not a problem. <laughs> and David is, yeah, 13, just thinking, what, what the heck? Yeah, <laughs> this is amazing. And, and uh, in my chat with Sebastian, he had another great story about Raymond where Sebastian really went out of his way. Uh, and I, I love this about, about him. And I love talking to Sebastian because I, I'm also such a huge nerd <laughs> and anyone who's listened to Seb and he's going to get his own episode for sure. But anybody yeah. who's listened to Seb knows that he at that time, especially was like Dragon Ball kid. You yeah. know, <laughs> he, he was like, how do I find my master Roshi? And when he meets David and hears about his dad, he was like, there we go. That's master <laughs> Roshi. I found him. He can do the Kamehameha. This is the guy. <laughs> he can jump from 20 feet apparently and be totally fine. So he seeks him out in Sarcel and he's like getting training notes from mm -hmm. Raymond. He's like, how do I become stronger? You're so strong. You know, what do I need to do 
to get strong like you? Like, what about upper body? I, I know you've told me some lower body stuff. And Raymond just pops into like a front lever on like the bunk bed that they're in the kid's room or something. And he's just in a front lever. And he goes, well, you know, this is a really good one. If you can do this, work up to this, like that's a good one. And then he like takes a second. And like, well, actually, this is a better one if you're strong enough and starts doing like front lever pull-ups. <laughs> and he's 60 years old at the time. And Sebastian's like, oh, it's so casual that yeah. he doesn't even think like that's hard. He's just like, all right, takes a note. <laughs> like, yeah, you pull yourself yeah. up, two pull-ups if you can. <laughs> and he goes back to talk to David. Oh, your dad showed me a really cool exercise. Mm -hmm. And he goes to try and get into front lever and he can't do it. It's like, hmm, wait a second. Let me, well, I, I must've done it wrong. It goes, can't do it again. <laughs> and they both just realize like, no, actually Raymond's just that friggin' strong. Damn, <laughs> that dude. He could do front lever pull-ups with no warm-up at age 60 <laughs> on a bunk bed <laughs> ah man that's such a wild yeah these are such incredible great moments and stories and it's so cool we get to hear them directly from you know our heroes that are still living and, and able and we're probably going to hear more potentially yeah. that come out over the coming years as, absolutely as we unearth some of this parkour history I, I love these stories because, again, this really echoes my experience learning about parkour. Mm. Uh, uh, for a quick aside, and we'll go into this probably a little bit more, but, I mean, I remember seeing the first video of yeah. parkour that I saw, and it was David Bell's En Avance Toujours, and it almost didn't even make sense. Like, it didn't register in my brain that it was real. Yeah. And my friend Calvin that showed me was trying to explain it to me. He's like, that happened. He was, he was, the best thing is we're, we're on a library computer. Neither of us <laughs> had computers. So we go to the library and he's like, oh, I need to show you this crazy video on YouTube. I'm like, all right, what, what do I search? And he's like, I can't remember what it's called. It starts with a P and we couldn't remember. We searched like the letter P and then like <laughs> jumping, nothing shows up. Eventually he's like, well, it was like, the guy was like Spider-Man, but in real life. And he was like jumping off buildings and you thought he was going to die, but he didn't. He was totally fine. <laughs> so we searched like Spider-Man guy jumps off building, doesn't die. <laughs> <laughs> and the first video that comes up was the En Avance Toujours uh, David Bell video. And it was similar, I imagine, me seeing that to how, you know, Sebastian and David must have felt hearing these stories. From I think Raymond. that's so true across so many, especially people in our generation, people that came up with the video as, as their first exposure to parkour had the same exact, I saw the Ripley's Believe It or Not segment was my very OG. first engagement with it, which I think has clips from that same video. And maybe not, I don't remember what was on Ripley's or not, but all I know is I had the exact same experience, which was just like, what the hell am I watching? Like that's happening. Those guys are doing that. They don't have whatever. Like this isn't CGI. This isn't pads. This isn't um, a stunt in a movie. This is a guy that like that's possible. And yeah. it blew me the hell away. Yeah. And <clears throat> imagine seeing it in person. Oh my God. And so this is kind of where our founding generation mm -hmm. of parkour comes into the picture. They're all young kids. And it's really, really important also to say right now that all of the founders had kind of their own unique path to parkour and yeah. we're going to give them as much time each as as we possibly can on the show but for today's episode since we are focusing on raymond a lot of it is going to be a little bit more david bell heavy than modern parkour maybe represents mm -hmm. in actuality but again for the sake of the show you've got david and through david sebastian and then you've also got uh Shao and William and Fung learning from Raymond and seeing this firsthand inspiration. The interesting thing to me is that you also have on the kind of counter side, Raymond being this inspiration and then absolutely refusing to help them directly unless they really, really, really bugged him. <laughs> you know, he's like the old man that you have to really like, you got to I won't train you. Yeah, you have to hike yeah. up the 20 mile road <laughs> yeah. to, to get information from him. Not not actually, but kind of metaphorically. Yeah. And when he would give them information, a lot of times it was just, oh, I could do that when I was seven. <laughs> you know, and David's like 15, training his butt off, trying to be like his dad that he worships and, you know, has this this vision of as the, you know, an immaculate athlete. 
and he trains as hard as he can and shows his dad and his dad's like yeah i could do that when i was 10 and i did it better (laughs) and i could do it at night when i was exhausted and here you get this really interesting realism i think that raymond brings to parkour training Mm. that turns the games that we'll talk about and you know in the future but turns the games that that david and sebastian and the other founders were kind of playing to discover parkour it gives them a little bit more of an edge it gives them this self-awareness of mortality almost and seriousness and kind of a dark side that they wouldn't have picked up just from George Hubert. Mm. And I think that this seriousness lends eventually what becomes parkour, a practicality that's really, really hard to overstate because it is what initially separates it from everything else that people had seen. And it was the motivator, especially for David that drove them to accomplish these incredible extreme feats, you know, really like working that end of the spectrum of human Mm -hmm. ability among other things, but Raymond's inspiration and also kind of his neglect was like this negative contributing factor emotionally for them. It's like, Mm -hmm. well, like no matter what, I'm not going to be good enough. Let me see how hard I can train. Maybe someday I'll do something to impress him. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, I think, especially for David where, in those early years, some of these things were coming from. And that is just really fascinating <laughs> to me from a developmental yeah. perspective because you've got être fort être utile, you've got this really healthy communal or community oriented, self motivated, sort of but service, service, service oriented. Yes, exactly. Service oriented <clears throat> model that is then kind of distorted through this lens of trauma that Raymond experiences Mm. and he passes on both, right? He passes on all the positives Mm. and he, he passes on directly these lessons. Like, yeah, it's great if you're strong, but if you're not helping people with it, it doesn't matter. Like you're just going to be a bodybuilder Mm. doing muscles in the mirror. Like what good does that do for society? Mm. Look at my example. I'm how many people have I saved? I'm sure he (laughs) didn't say that, but that's very obvious from his life. Yeah. His life was the example mm-hmm. of être faux petre utile for these young boys. And then you have his trauma that kind of distorts that message a little bit and provides a counterbalance. Yeah. And no, I love that. That's like almost the story of the father and the son in some ways, like archetypally, which is we tend to want to make the world better. And so you know, by the very nature of us progressing, it doesn't, it's not as savage every generation, right? But then our fathers, you know, literally and figuratively have been like, they've been molded and sculpted by a more savage world. And so passing that on in a weird way is like, it's just a weird line to cross, which is like, I want the world to be better. I don't want my kids to maybe have to go through that stuff. But at the same time, I went through it. And so I also want to pass on the level of intensity that exists, which is sort of infinite, you know, you know, and yeah. that's where it can become, I mean, I just, I don't know if that's what was going on in Raymond's head, but I do find it fascinating as well, which is this ability to like, he was pushed so fucking far, excuse my language, to the limits of what's possible for the human by his circumstances and by his choices that it's it's almost like other things that are, you know, now that life has calmed down a bit, they barely register on his radar. Yeah. I think you, you hit the nail on the head with that because why else, you know, like you said, he was raised in a savage world. Why else would he not be part of his family's lives directly? You know, why else would he decide to, yeah, with Monique, let David be raised by his grandfather. These definitely seem from the outside, like decisions that probably stem from an awareness that maybe I don't want to put my children through everything that I went through. And then when David comes to him and says, train me, you know, (laughs) I want to be put through some of these things. Mm. And he gives him the, well, whatever you do, it's not really good enough. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, well, I could do that when I was (laughs) eight or I, when I was 12, I did that. But at, yeah, 2 a.m. in the rain, that for David becomes kind of the the emotional landscape mm. that maybe he needed to tap into that next level mm. of primal mm. 
development. You know, he's he develops that that savagery almost again mm. in a different landscape wow. and takes some of those lessons from the jungle and they all start applying them, looking for that struggle, looking for the shadow, mm. you know, mm-hmm. where is that shadow of my life experience? Everything is so positive. Where's the struggle? Where's the mortality, the sense of value? Mm. And how do I bring that into the Banlu? And that is really where you get the actual development of parkour. Hmm. So before we dive into that, yeah. I would like to wrap up yeah, yeah, let's Raymond's story. Conclude Raymond's story because it's important and poignant part of the whole thing. Yeah, so in the mid-1990s, David, Sebastian, Chao, William, Feng, Jan, Malik, Guilain, uh, Laurent Piemontesi, they're all on their own journey, but they're all also kind of feeding off of each other's energy and working together to create something. They don't know what it is at the time. And Raymond is kind of affiliated loosely just by association and he's watching what's happening and they're getting a couple words of encouragement here, some advice there. Some of it doesn't ring as true you know some of it they're like you sound like an old gymnastics coach i'm not gonna Mm -hmm. jump between these buildings and point my toes i don't Mm -hmm. care about that (laughs) that's not what this is for but some of it is is really helpful and 1997 they kind of have their big break we're going to go into that but 1997 parkour through a live demonstration um, at essentially a firefighters expo in paris parkour is introduced in person to the world and people see it for the first time really in a recapitulation of that George Hubert demo in mm. uh, 1911 or 1916 and Raymond sees this group start to take off and they each kind of start to also go their separate ways at the end of the 1990s but no one was really checking up on Raymond and like you said when you've experienced those highs and lows and you've had such extremes in your life normal everyday life doesn't really register Mm. as much as it did before and i think that nobody recognized maybe that that was happening with him and on new year's eve in 1999 uh, david and uh, jean Jean francois i believe get a message on their phone saying um, essentially the guard is dead but doesn't surrender it's his dad quoting a Napoleon general mm. who said this before committing suicide. And Jean-Francois is the first on the scene and, and finds his father Raymond dead by his own hand. And David finds out. And that is kind of the dark end mm. to Raymond's legacy. And obviously his legacy continues that we're still talking about it. Um, And there had been, you know, additionally, it's really, it's important to say this is the biggest kind of moment that we're unsure of and we want to be really sensitive about. But it's really, really important for the listeners to understand this. I think Sebastian said it great when he addressed this topic in uh, the Modus podcast Mm -hmm. and his podcast with Rafe. When Raymond was living with the Bell and Sarcel, he lived there for a decade, no problems. He was great uncle Raymond and the family was fine and he was interesting. He didn't quite fit in. You know, he slept outside sometimes in a tent Mm -hmm. and he would take the kids hunting in the forest and they'd shoot birds and squirrels and things like that. And he was a little bit more primal for sure than maybe some of his nephews and, and the rest of his extended family, but it wasn't anything crazy. And then all of a sudden he was banned from the house. And we don't really know what happened. We know that something happened that was strong enough, severe enough to warrant the Bell family in Sarcel to not acknowledge Raymond as a figure to look up to anymore. And I think that it's important, part of his legacy, to recognize that shadow side, for lack of a better word, of Raymond's life. Mm. That, you know, he did burn a lot of bridges and he was a hero to some 
and clearly to others he was less than a hero Mm. and in the end he ended up taking his own life and whatever led up to that you know he was struggling with a lot of inner demons and a lot of the things that made him such a hero to so many and inspired David and Sebastian probably a lot of those demons were what motivated him to do the incredible things that he did Mm. so I think for the listener, what what I want you to walk away from is that, you know, Raymond Bell was a very human figure. He was incredibly flawed in a lot of ways. He was also an amazing athlete. He was a undoubtedly an inspiration to what parkour has become and what motivated parkour in the late nineties and mid nineties and late eighties even. Um, But you can look up to him as an athlete, but I think keep in mind that maybe he's not a hero. And again, it's, it's on, um, you know, David and the bell family, if they want to say more about his legacy, you know, that space is there. And I think that until then it's safest to just acknowledge both sides of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously very sensitive and so much that we have to dance around because obviously we just don't know. Yeah. And it's and not really say, for us to speculate on. But yeah, what we do know is what I, you just laid out. Absolutely. And I will say that if you are interested in maybe a little bit more detail, <clears throat> it's not a lot more detail, but yeah. um, Sebastian Foucault's podcasts with Rafe Kelly and with the Modus podcast, he, he does talk about it a little bit more. Uh, and he obviously was around firsthand for that. Um, not, you know, the, the family stuff, but mm. he was there knowing everybody involved and you do get a little bit as well in Julie Angel's book, Breaking the Jump. So if you want to do your own research on this one yeah. and get a little bit more deeper. depth. Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. are your resources. Yeah. And we may never, I mean, we probably even may never know completely what happens because, you know, it's it's just like some things the world does not ever get full yeah. public access to. And maybe there's just so many different angles and it's hard to sometimes agree on what's true when so many emotions and family and stuff gets involved. Um, but it is, yeah, it's just a very interesting, you know, just point to note and very fascinating. I love how you say he's a human figure and yeah, what a, what a wild, wild story and wild, um, crazy, you know, there's so much to take from it. Anna. Yeah. And I, th- I think his life, one thing that we talked about actually before the podcast is, his life in a lot of ways is a mirror I think of struggles that many practitioners go through Mm. and that is balancing maybe trauma for lack of a better word yeah and motivation and we see that reflected in David's approach especially early as well you can get motivation from a lot of emotions yeah from a lot of sources and for Raymond it seems clear that a lot of his motivation came from those dark places of the human psyche. It came from violence. It came from a need to protect, but it was not protecting others initially. It was, I need to protect. scar myself. Yeah. It was like that episode or that scene in Goodwill Hunting where Goodwill Hunt, Will Hunting is describing how his dad would ask him which like device he would let him, he wanted to be beat with. And he would always choose the most fucked up one. Cause he's like, cause fuck him. That's fuck yeah. Him. Just yeah. like where sometimes the only control you have is to be, you know, make yourself harder than your harder environment. Harder than your environment could ever be. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Yeah. I love, I love it. And um, yeah, I think it definitely relates. I think what I said before the podcast was, you know, invariably, not invariably, some people won't take it there, but I think a lot of parkour practitioners end up grappling with life's biggest and most deepest questions through their practice, because it is a powerful practice to, to attack some of these existential uh, questions that again, they're, they're human questions. They're things that we'll never completely know the answer to. It's up to you to make your own interpretations on like what you believe is true. And if there's a way that you can live life that is better than the, another way and et cetera. And so there's, there's a lot at, a lot of meat in in the history of parkour and i think it's evident again with practitioners of today we see we see all kinds of people and how it you know becomes a tool and how it can also um you know we just see we see the same kinds of energy sometimes where we see people that are 
I think they're can... finding they're trying to find themselves and it's a struggle. And I think that quote, I wonder, you know, you know the quote in French, don't you? Which one? The guard dies but never surrenders. Oh, uh, le gars mormon ne pas. It's the Napoleon one that you yeah. talked about though. It's Napoleon. It's an, uh, the, uh, not Napoleon, but a Napoleon general, guard. A general or a guard of Napoleon's, yeah. And that's a very interesting um, piece that he would send that to his two children or two of his children. I don't yeah. know if we know anything about what Daniel got, but it, it's almost, um, well, yes, sadly, I think Daniel had, had also passed at that point. Oh, okay. Um, but the guard dies, but never surrenders. It definitely has a connotation of, you know, I'm, I'm going to take my own life before it's taken out of my hands by mm. outside factors. Yeah. And that is very, that seems very in line with Raymond and the way he lived his life and how he valued control. Mm. You know, a lot of his life was control over my body, over my emotions, over my situation. Mm. And in that situation, suicide is really the ultimate expression of control, deciding your fate, your ultimate moment mm. with your own hands yeah. and of your own volition. And obviously it also shows maybe a lack of maybe sensitivity to how that would affect others because it's not just a decision you make for yourself. Yeah. So you were saying that I think the interesting thing too, to get out of this for our fellow parkour nerds out there is <laughs> this ties into what we talked about in the Abair episode mm. where the difference in the, in the prehistory episode, we talked a little bit about the difference between that gymnastics and ancient gymnastics and parkour and how, there is an element of the philosophy behind the actual practice mm. is integral to both parkour and to that ancient gymnastics. And I think here's another example of where that philosophy and that search for meaning is you can't have the practice without that in its deepest sense. Mm. And that's not true of other sports or many other sports mm. you know people don't go out and play baseball <laughs> because they're looking for meaning that might be a coping mechanism you might go play baseball because your at home life is a mess and you need to get out of the house mm -hmm. but you don't create that sport of baseball <laughs> to cope with those deep existential questions and i think parkour is unique in modern sports mm -hmm. and practices in that sense you get it in martial arts Martial yeah. arts was created as a physical way of responding to some of these emotional questions. Mm -hmm. And you have, a, there's a long, long tradition of, you know, Zen Buddhism and Confucianism and all of these other philosophies and religions that are tied into martial arts and martial arts practice, which is a good hint for next week's yeah, episode indeed. where we're getting a little bit into Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan and how Dragon Ball <laughs> was another motivating force for parkour. But I just, I think that is so fascinating and powerful and so important as a practitioner and anyone who's a coach, anyone who, if you're listening as a parent and you have a child who wants to do parkour, the meat is not in the Kong vaults and the arm mm -hmm. jumps and the 180s and the backflips. Mm -hmm. The meat of the practice, what you get out of it, it's how you let those movements teach you about yourself, teach you more importantly, I think about how you relate to others and mm. how you relate to the environment. Yeah. And I think again, this Raymond Raymond story is just such a, an example of how we're functions of our environment and how parkour was created in response to that conundrum. Mm. Well said, love all of that. I can't wait for next week. Again, one of my favorite episodes, um, it's always going to be one of my favorites, but this who is knew Goku was uh, <laughs> an inspiration for yeah. parkour. Yeah. So we're, we'll be getting into more last thing I wanted to touch on because it might be less relevant as the episodes go on. I recently, you know, I saw another interpret or translation of my French is whack. It's weak. Uh, it, which was be strong to be helpful. Not that I'm saying, I'm, I'm just curious. I think that's just uh, something, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that in terms of useful versus helpful, you know? Yeah. I, I, I hadn't seen that in translation as much. I mean, util, I mean, oh, util obviously. It shares a root word yeah. with uh, English. Utility. Utility, exactly. Yeah. So utility, it's useful mm. in the sense that it is also helpful. Yeah. 
Um, I think that those two are both good words to yeah. describe it. It. I think the takeaway there is if you're not able to use your strength, either for yourself or for others, but in particular for others, mm. then why even bother? Mm. And I think that is really where George Bear came to that. What does strength mean outside the context of helping others? Does it have a meaning? Does it matter? Those are questions I think that are pretty, pretty important. And Raymond came to that realization when he joined the Sapé Pompier and obviously David and Sebastian and the other founders picked that up in their own training and ran even farther mm. with that methodology. Awesome. Can't wait for the weeks to come. And man, thank you again. This has been episode three of Parkour History and we're, we're chugging along. And again, if you are listening and you have any corrections, please send mm. them in so that we can address them in future episodes. Uh, we have recorded quite a few in advance. So if we don't get to your uh, correction for several episodes, we promise we'll get to it. Might just be in episode six or seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get there. All righty. Thanks again. Let's go.